This meeting is being recorded. Okay, back to class. So once again, great work on the machines. Uh, the machine sprint is an unusual amount of work. We're now back to the normal pace. Uh, a few more technical assignments, and then we're going to have a few non-technical weeks uh, in the run-up to uh, your final projects. And let me update my notes. So for calendar, today is input devices. And then we have two, I keep saying recitations are important. I guess they all are. The next two recitations are a special different format. We're trying an experiment called the Fab Month of a range of programs for the Fab Lab Network. And so this was an issue to the class project explaining that these two recitations are going to be in a different place. And there's a registration link for them. That's because they're going to be more open. One is a review of the whole Fab ecosystem of Fab Labs, Fab Foundation, Fab City, all of the uh, programs across the network. And that's on the 15th. And then on the 29th is going to be the range of educational programs. Uh, so there'll be great tours uh, for what's going on across the Fab Lab network in general, and in particular, a number of things that might be interesting for you for your next steps. And once again, with this issue for those two recitations only, they move to a different place and there's a link to register to participate in them because those will be with bigger groups. And then we'll be back to the usual format for the re remaining recitations. So on to input devices. So this is about how you get signals into your processors. And I'm going to cover all sorts of sensors. The featured assignment was um, in the Fab Shell example, Adrian shows lots of different types of input devices. Uh, and so he has a nice tour through them, explaining them and how he implemented them. Your individual assignment is going to be to measure something. Add a sensor to a board that you designed and read it. And then as a group, we want you to use the test equipment in your lab to look at both analog and digital signals, to look at raw analog and how they turn into digital messages. And with that, we're going to tour lots of sensors. Now, to start, you need to get signals into your processor. So this is a data sheet for a particularly interesting processor, What one of the AVR families. And out of all the ones we use, this one has the most powerful uh, analog peripherals. So it, it has uh, amplifiers. Let's see if I can find that quickly. Um, uh, it, it has a group of uh, amplifiers built in to condition low-level signals. And it has multiple amplifiers you can configure in all sorts of ways. So we'll be using the ports that talk to the pins. And those read, read in digital, art, uh, digital signals. We'll be using a comparator. All that does is it compares two voltages and says which is higher or lower. That might not sound useful, but what's handy about it is you can do it very quickly. And it turns out there's lots of use cases. We'll be using an analog to digital converter. And that turns a voltage into numbers. And then many of the sensors we use increasingly speak I2C, which is a digital protocol. 
So instead of reading a voltage, you read a digital message that gets conditioned in the sensor. And I'll show you examples of all of those. So to start, we just have uh, this is a button you press. Um, this is a switch you slide. And so uh, in this example, let's see, I just, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to do a number of examples. This is just a button on a shell. And uh, I, I'm uh, sending a message out when I push the button. It says button down, button up. And then, um, uh, Oh, let's see. Let's stay with the video. The um, and then I, I do the same thing in uh, Micro Python. And so when you push the button, once I get it configured, you push the button and it sends out a message. So uh, not this is simplest starting thing in Arduino. Um, you say I want it to be an input, and then uh, there's two details with buttons. One is if this is a pin, you can connect it to ground. But when the switch is open, the voltage there could be anything. So inside, there's a pull-up resistor you can optionally turn on. So when the switch is open, it's held high. When you close it, it, it comes down. And the other thing you need to be aware of is when you open and close a button, it doesn't actually look like that. If you know, this is time and this is voltage. What it actually looks like is if you zoom in on that part, um, it sort of looks like that, that it bounces, it, sort of literally, it sort of, it can make erratic contact. And so there's a very short period where it's unreliable. And so once the button switches, you don't want to read it again right away. The most straightforward way to handle what's called debouncing is just to have a short time delay before you uh, check the button again. So in the code, I set the button as an input, and I check to see if it's high. And in this case, the debouncing is because I'm taking a little bit of time to send a message. And then uh, similar in the Python, in the Python, I set it as an input with the pull up. I read it, and I send out the message. So that's just reading a button. Now, a little bit more useful is, let's do um, this example. So that's a magnet. And I'm measuring the magnetic field. Now, if I invert it, the sign goes in the opposite direction because the magnetic field has a direction. And so there's an orientation of the sensor. Now there's no magnet. And if I rotate it, you'll see right now it's uh, 418 um, 0.9. And then there it's 0.3. That tiny change is actually Earth's magnetic field. So that's using a very handy sensor. Uh, this is a Hall effect sensor. So you send a current through a semiconductor, and the current generates a voltage that depends on the magnetic field strength. And this gives you a voltage that's proportional to magnetic field. So then on the board, what I'm doing is I get the voltage and I'm reading it in to an analog to digital converter. And so I've got versions on, um, uh, this is a version using the Tiny 412. And in the Arduino version, I'm using an analog read that uh, reads the voltage on the pin. Um, this is the version for a D11. And so, there are many different settings you can descend into for the A to D of how many digits it uses, um, how fast it converts. This is just the simplest example of using the default. 
And so a magnetic field sensor, uh, one of the most common uses for this is, let's say you have a box and you want to know when the lid is closed. You can put a magnet in the lid and it can be a very small magnet and then the hall sensor and it senses the proximity. Or if you have a carriage and you want to know uh, when you're going to hit the end of the range of travel of the carriage, you can use a magnetic field sensor with a magnet to determine we're getting close to the end. So those are co common uses of it. Now, here's a more interesting, even more interesting part. So now, let's load the code, start this running. So now I'm moving the magnet and you see I'm getting X, Y, Z information. So I'm not just getting a magnetic field. The magnetic field has a strength and a direction. And this is giving me uh, all three components of the magnetic field. So that's using this device that actually comes in the same size package uh, is only slightly more expensive. But this device, instead of putting out an analog voltage, it has three magnetometers, one each in the X, Y, Z axis. And then this has an I2C interface. It has a digital interface. So for the, uh, this example, uh, for I2C, it has two lines. Uh, there's an SCL line and an SDA line. So this is, uh, this is for clocking, this is for data, but they can go in either direction. And so the way you do this is you have pull-up resistors. And these are typically uh, 1K or 5K. And so those hold the line high. And then either side can pull the line low to, to share those lines. So you always, uh, some breakout boards have those resistors on it. When you make the circuit, you always put in these uh, pull up resistors. And otherwise, all I'm doing is I'm taking the SCL lines and the SDA lines and sending them to the processor. And so um, for Arduino library, you use the wire is what the name is of the I2C library. So you, you start the wire library, you start a data rate, um, all of this code is for this particular vector magnetometer, there's a sequence you need to do to wake it up. So this wakes it up, then this configures it. And there's a lot of internal configuration. Typically these data sheets, if, let's see if we go back, these I2C devices, um, the protocols can be quite complex. If we go down to, once we go from the electrical to the digital, um, there can be, oh, and actually on this one, it's not even here. That's right, there's a whole separate data sheet for this device that explains uh, the protocol. So let's go back to the C code. And so this is with the Arduino library, waking it up. And then once I've done it, I request a reading, and then I get back the X, Y, Z components of the magnetic field. And then I also have an example. Let's see. I think I have three examples here. Uh, this is an example where I'm doing it without Arduino, where I'm doing it in the native C. And this is a software implementation of I2C. It's a pretty simple protocol. So rather than using the I2C module in the processor, I'm actually just writing code to implement I2C that is easy to do. And then uh, this is doing, oh, let's see, this is the Python plotter for it. So 
these vector magnetometers have all sorts of handy uses in interfaces. Uh, um, they're used, for example, in gear shift levers in cars, or they're used in joysticks in gaming systems. Um, you can use them in rotary knobs. Uh, there are all sorts of user interface devices where the vector magnetometer lets you connect some motion to a sensor but now you don't need a physical connection like a potentiometer. You just move the magnet around in proximity to the vector magnetometer. So if you just wanna see, is there a magnetic field and is it stronger or weaker, you can use the Hall sensor. If you wanna know the uh, orientation, you can use the vector magnetometer. Uh, Potentiometer is a variable resistor as a function of angle. And so a classic useful use of that is, uh, this is a stepper motor board and there's a, a volt, a, a resistor that sets the current going to the motor. And so on this board, I have a potentiometer that I use to uh, set that voltage. Now we come to my favorite sensor. So you can loosely think of this as just capacitance, but it's it can do so much more than that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, these are standard libraries. Um, let's see, uh, this is a library uh, for measuring uh, capacitance. Uh, this was a project uh, Quentin did to use it to track position. And so what I'm gonna describe now, you can measure resistance, you can measure capacitance, inductance, you can measure position, pressure, tilt, you can get from this acceleration, humidity, proximity, all with the same sensor. Um, you can measure touch. So this, for example, is a touchpad, like on your computer, and it's measuring position that there. Uh, this is a multi-touchpad, so it can sense multiple touches at the same time. Uh, with the Adrianino, um, this is a force sensor. So it's a capacitive measurement with an elastomer. And then it gives you a signal that depends on the force. And unlike a force sensing resistor, this is just simply a function of the the material and the thickness of the foam so you can make it as sensitive you can tune the response just by uh choosing the material you use in that um, this is an example of using uh this to make a sensor that measures bend angle so all of that is simply done with a step response there's two versions, loading and transmit receive. So let's start with the simplest, simpler one, which is loading. And well, here, let me show you a fun example and then explain what's going on. So um, here's a board and th there's almost nothing here. So in this example, I've got a shao and the only thing I have is a somewhat large resistor, a mega ohm resistor. So I have a pin going out. The other side of the resistor goes to an input. That goes to a load. And then I have two other connectors, one for ground, and I have a shield, which I'll explain. So it's just one resistor. And so let's see what we can do with that. So here um, I've got one plate connected to the load. I've got the other plate connected to ground. 
And then here I'm measuring the measurement, which I haven't explained yet, but I will in a minute. So first of all, if you look at the numbers here, so 874, um, when I bring in a piece of paper, it goes up a little bit. Now, when I bring in my hand, it's sensing my hand through the piece of paper. Um, I'm going to bring in a, a book. As the book moves in, it's going up because it's sensing the book. And if I bring in my hand, it's actually sensing my hand through the book. So you can make all sorts of interface sensors where on the outside is stuff that looks and feels good, but it doesn't do anything and you're actually sensing from the inside. And then with this, here's an example where I made a position sensor. So I'm moving a dielectric rod, a plastic rod, and it's measuring the displacement and using this to do a position measurement. So what's going on? So in the loading version, we have this charging resistor and a mega ohm is typical for that. This goes to a plate, and then this goes to an input. And then in the video I showed, I had a ground electrode. So there's an electric field going between the plate and ground. And what I do is on the output here, I make a step up and a step down. That's why this is called step response. Um, if I look on the other side of the resistor, between these two plates, that equals a capacitor. And so if I look on the other side of the resistor, what I've got is a circuit of a resistor connected to a capacitor. So that's an RC circuit. And instead of charging up instantly, um, it charges up and the rate that it charges is a function of the capacitance. So what I get is this step response curve that looks like that. And the, the shape of the curve depends on what's in the field. So in a second, I'll talk about measuring it. But it, if I have two plates and, and I change the distance between them, that'll change the capacitance. Um, if I have a material, materials are described by what's called a dielectric constant. And that's essentially how much charge they store internally. So if I move a material in and out, that'll change uh, it. Um, if I just have these plates and I have humidity, humidity, the humidity in air will actually change the dielectric constant. Um, for example, if I have a tube and I have a, a liquid in the tube, um, and I measure the step response. If I tilt the tube, it'll vary how much liquid is in it, and that'll change the signal. Um, you know, if I have grains of rice and I make this measurement, it'll change with the depth of rice. All of those things change the field. So to make this measurement, we want to know the shape of this charging curve. And there's two ways to do it. So I'm plotting voltage versus time. One way to do it is to pick a time and measure the voltage. Another way to do it is in the opposite direction, which is pick a voltage and measure the time. So you can either 
fix the voltage and measure the time, or you can fix the time and measure the voltage. Uh, and this happens very quickly. Depending on the values, uh, the time to do this might be, say, 10 microseconds. And so the resolution you need here is on the order of a microsecond. But our processors are very fast, so they can do that. So uh, this is an example where I'm going into uh, the processor, and I'm using the analog to digital converter. And so I'm making an a uh, ADC reading. And let's go back to, um, let's go to input devices and embedded programming. And if we take just the, the little AT tiny 412, and go to the data sheet, the analog to digital converter is um, quite a complex system. So um, go down. So if you go to the data sheet, it's quite a complex system for the ADC. You, you can pick which pins are the input, you can pick, do you want to measure one voltage or the difference between two voltages? What do you, um, how many digits? The faster you convert, you have the result faster, but it's uh, noisier. And then um, how many digits of resolution and what you refer it to. So there's quite a bit you can configure in the ADC. So let's go back to the step response. So in, this version, um, I'm showing three numbers. Uh, it's similar to the video I showed you. Here, I'm measuring the voltage at three different times. And so if we uh, look at the code for that one, um, I'm, delay I'm delaying and I'm reading the ADC. Now, more recently, I did uh, for this class an interesting variant. Remember, the RP2040 processor has what's called the PIO. And the PIO are, around the main processor, are eight little processors that run very quickly with a very simple instruction set. So in, in this video, here's what's going on. Uh, an LVDT, Linear Variable Displacement Transformer, is a standard position sensor, and it's, it's a transformer with a moving coil. There's a coil, and then you can move uh, the coupling to the magnetic field in it. And they're fairly expensive. In what I'm doing here, uh, CVDT is my name. It's not a standard one. Um, um, what I'm doing here is um, uh, it's like an LVDT, but with capacitance. So if you look at this picture, uh, what's going on in that picture is I've got this charge sense resistor. And I've got that as an inner conductor. Then around that, I've got this moving tube. Um, and this is a dielectric, a, a plastic. And then around that, I've got this outer tube. And this outer tube is connected to ground. And the reason I'm doing that is the inner part is very sensitive. If you touch it, it measures that. So we want to protect it. So the outer shield being ground 
means we don't care what's out here because it's protected by that shield. We're sensing on this inner wire. And then <clears throat> as I move this insulator in and out, I'm changing the amount of material between those two plates. And so if we go back to this video, um, if you look at the video, there's the grounded outside. You can see just peeking out the inner sensor. And then I'm sliding between them this tube that's changing the amount of plastic inside the capacitor. And that's my position sensor. Now, in this example, I'm doing this completely with the PIO. So I'm going to show you the code in a second. But uh, before I do that, Let's just talk through the logic again. So this is voltage and time. I'm applying these steps. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure the time first it takes to go up. So the time from here to here. And then I'm going to do the same thing coming down. I'm going to measure the time it takes to go down. And I'm going to do that in this example completely in software because these PIOs are so powerful. So um, let's first look down here. I'm going to run the RP2040 at 250 megahertz. Um, I'm, here I'm going to set up a step response. And then the code is really simple. Um, I have a loop time and a settling time. Um, I tell it the loop and settling time. And then I make the measurement and I report it. Now, what's going on with the loop and settling time is while you're making this measurement, there's all sorts of electric fields around you, very low level ones that make it noisy. So rather than doing this once, what I'm doing it is I'm doing it many, many times and I'm saving up all of the readings. And so the more times I read it, the, the more resolution I get because I suppress the noise. So that's the loop setting. And then the other one is, I, if you look at what I drew, it looks like that. When I get the reading, um, I'm only here. But I want to reset before each reading. So I don't want to. What I don't want to do is immediately start discharging. Instead, I wait a settling time. After I read, after I read the conversion, I want to wait. And this is time just for the reading to settle. So it resets in the physics before I do it again. So that's the settling time. So all you need to know is this routine takes a loop time and a settling time. And it takes two pin numbers and makes that measurement. Now, under the hood is something much more complex. So the in the RP2040, there's a big section of the data sheet that explains these PIOs. And so this, this routine defines a little program that runs. And there's eight of these little tiny processors. And you have to tell the processor the program to run and the pins to use. This is the program to run. And you've seen Arduino, which is C. You've seen Python. This is now very low level. This is assembly language. This is code that runs in these tiny processors. For today's class, you don't need to understand this. You can just use it, but I'll explain it. 
and so <clears throat> remember down here i'm telling the processor loop and how many times to loop and how many times to settle so in the code down here i pull in the loop i move that from where it came in to one register i pull in settling um then i'm going to loop so here's where i'm charging up then this is a logic routine where I'm checking, did the pin toggle? If not, I keep loop looping. And this is a counter. And so each time the pin didn't switch, I count. But here's what's different. Unlike when you write Python or Arduino, each instruction here is guaranteed to take exactly one cycle. And that's really fast. The processor is running at 250 megahertz. So each instruction is four nanoseconds. And these instructions take exactly one cycle. So this little teeny bit of code is a counter that can run at a four nanosecond tick rate, which is very fast. So once the pin crosses the threshold, then what I do is I save the value and I let it um, settle. Then this was charging up. Now I'm going to charge down. And then I do the same sort of measurement. And I, do, I keep doing that until the loop gets to zero. And then I send back to the main processor the reading. So again, in the code, you don't really need to understand that. Um, all you need to know is this creates one a little machine to make that measurement. But under the hood, this is how it's doing it. And so in this example, I'm using it just to do that measurement. But you could do any of the measurements I showed you. Um, you know, in this example, I'm doing all of these. And so one RP2040 can give you eight channels of this uh, measurement at very high resolution. So a few final notes on that. One is I'm averaging to reduce noise. Um, in the plotting program, I'm actually doing more noise reduction. Um, uh, this is what's called a smoothing filter, where I make a low pass filter to help reduce the noise even further. Um, and then right after the resistor is sensitive, so if you have a processor here, but you want to make a measurement over here, if you have the resistor here and you go all the way over to here, this whole region is sensitive. It's sensing to um, any interference. So one thing you can do is take the driving signal and use that to make a shield. But another thing you can do is this is a tiny part that just does the comparison very quickly. It's a comparator. So another thing you can do is if you need, if you need your processor far from the measurement, you can actually put the comparator right at where you're making the measurement um, uh, to separate it. So that's step response. Now, um, the step response measures um, the, the coupling to ground, and it'll couple to ground wherever it is. So it'll cu couple to whatever, if this is a ground over here, whatever grounds are in your environment, it'll couple to. Uh, uh, it can be helpful to control both sides. So in this version, what I'm going to do looks like this. I have a transmitter, and then I have a receiver. And in the receiver, I've got uh, this divider. And so what this one does is you transmit and you receive. And then the response to that looks like this. You get a little charging pulse up and a little charging pulse down. And transmit receive doesn't 
depend on the ground because you're controlling both sides. And so with that, I um, this is a version where I've got the dividers uh, running on a shao. And here I've got two pairs of them. And so each of those is a transmitter and a receiver, and I'm reading it out. And then it's sensing my proximity to it. And then it's sensing my motion across from it. So all sorts of interfaces, controllers, knobs, sliders, uh, buttons, material sensors can be done with step response. And finally, this is one of my favorite application notes. What th this app note is showing is um, this is showing the measurement we're making, but it's showing it as a function of frequency. And as you go up to higher frequencies, you start to probe chemical information. And so by doing this <clears throat> at much higher frequencies, this is different types of alcohols. Um, this is a martini, uh, gin and vermouth and the martini. This is different kinds of beer. This is wine after you open it. Uh, this is milk after you open it. You can learn all sorts of chemical information if you do this measurement at a high frequency. So that's step response. Next is temperature. So I touch it, it warms up, I let go, and it cools off. That's using a thermistor, which is a resistor whose resistance depends on temperature. And there's two kinds, NTC and RTD. Um, a if you look at the uh, resistance uh, versus temperature, um, one has a curve that looks like that, and one has a curve that looks like that. Um, so you generally use RTCs when you need to go to higher temperatures and NTCs at lower temperatures. But for both of them, there's a, a common trick. So consider this. This is the variable resistor. This is a fixed resistor. This is a voltage. And if we look at the voltage here, we have the total voltage range. And as this resistor varies, we'll go up and down a little bit around the middle of the range, which means we're wasting most of the digits of our analog to digital converter. So when you're measuring a small change, you want to measure a small change in a small signal, not a big signal. And a standard way we do that is what's called a bridge. So we have our power supply connected here. Um, let's say this is the variable resistor. And these have a characteristic value. So let's say this is nominally 1K. We make all of these matching. Then what we're going to do is we're going to measure the difference between the two sides of the bridge. So when all these resistors match, the same amount of current goes left and goes right, and you get nothing out. And then when this resistor increases or decreases, um, this number uh, varies. <clears throat> so what we've done is we've got a small change in a small signal, and then we can amplify that up, and we can use the whole range of our analog to digital converter because the baseline is zero, and then we're measuring around that. So that's a bridge circuit. And so on here, I've got my temperature sensor, and then I've got 
my other three resistors and I'm going into two pins and measuring the difference in voltage. So that's temperature. Uh, then to measure light, uh, this is a phototransistor. Um, you can kind of do this with an, you can use an LED as a crude light sensor. Uh, this is a much better light sensor. <clears throat> so this is one case where we use a bipolar transistor, not a MOSFET. But instead of a gate here, this is just responsive to light. And then we have a pull-up resistor. This goes to ground. And then we get a voltage out. And we read that voltage that's proportional to light. So um, uh, we have our pull-up resistor. We're going into an ADC pin. And we measure light. Now, let's say <clears throat> you wanted to sense somebody passing by. So you have a light sensor here. Um, it would, the signal would depend on the person passing by, but it would also depend on all the other light sources. So the next version is a very important trick called synchronous detection. So here's our light sensor in. Um, here's an LED out, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this on and off. <clears throat> so if I look at the signal coming into my light sensor, that has a varying baseline based on all the light sources, but on top of it, it has a modulation. And the modulation just comes from the light going from here to here. And so what I do is, rather than measuring the absolute signal, I measure the difference between when the light is on and when the light is off. And that just depends on what's coming from there. So in this version, I've got a, a light source as well as a light sensor. And here now is, <clears throat> this is the measurement when it's on, this is off, and that's the difference. And you'll see both vary as I move my finger, but the difference is just measuring the reflected light. So that's called synchronous detection. And the last version is, <clears throat> excuse me, this is, an, I, this is a sensor that now speaks I2C and has multiple light sensors, and it lets me measure color. And so there's all sorts of sensing you can use based on, and it, user interfaces you can do based on having uh, color. So that's using a uh, color sensor. Uh, loading slowly, but that's a link to it. Okay, lots to get through. Then um, for motion, um, I've got a, here, I'm going to pause here. Down at the bottom here, I've got a sensor, and now I'm going to try to sneak up on it. So I'm moving, now I've stopped. As soon as I move, it knows I'm moving. And then when I stop, it stops. So that's a sensor for me sneaking up. And so that's a Doppler radar. So it, it's, it's not a radar that measures distance. Um, it sends a signal back, and it looks for a change in frequency because something is moving. And these just put out a digital signal of is something moving. In the past, <clears throat> we use what were called pyroelectric sensors. The Doppler radars don't need optical sight, and they're, they're longer range, and they're much more sensitive. So that, that measures motion, but it doesn't give you distance. Um, so here's a sensor that measures distance. So it's measuring millimeters. Right now, I'm aiming down at the table, 
and it's measuring millimeters to the table. Then now I'm going to aim it up. And now I'm measuring distance to the ceiling above me. So I can measure out to a few meters and I can measure it at a re resolution of millimeters. So this is a wonderful device. And this is crazy what it does. Light is fast. Light travels a foot in a nanosecond. So to measure millimeters, you need to measure picoseconds, a tiny amount. And that's what this does. It puts out a light pulse. It measures the return at, with, at picoseconds very, very fast, and then puts out an I2C signal. Um, this is a tiny package. You can make it with reflow. But in this case, I'm using a breakout board. Uh, and the breakout board breaks out the signals from it. Um, and then uh, it gives you the uh, I2C signals to talk to it uh, with a library. And then the um, uh, a standard library uh, starts I2C and, and then asks it to start giving you ranging data. And then in the family of these, uh, this is the newest one in that family that instead of one of these is actually an eight by eight array. So it gives you a low resolution image with distance, you know, not enough to take a picture, but by having the actual image, you can see not just how far away something is, but you can get a sense of motion of it. Um, uh, so a, a, a low resolution imaging sensor. Uh, so that's uh, distance measurement. Uh, then a very handy thing is uh, for GPS, these used to be much more expensive. Now these are down to about $10, these GPS modules. And you, you just communicate with it as a serial device. And so when you turn it on, uh, you need to see the sky. Doesn't work. But once you can see the sky, or, or actually I'm doing this in the top floor where I am right now, where there's a roof above me, but not a, a big building. Uh, it, once you can talk to the satellites, then it gets messages from satellites. And by combining those messages, it figures out where it is uh, spatially. So you can track position like you do with your phone. But the other thing that's very handy is to do this, it gets a clock from the satellites. And these are atomic clocks, the most accurate time available. So the GPS receiver gives you position geographically, and it also gives you a very accurate uh, time base. OK, next comes this sensor. And so this is giving me roll, pitch, and yaw. So it's tracking how I'm moving that through space. And so you can use that to track a person. You can make, for example, virtual, virtual reality interfaces where you manipulate things. So that's using this fabulous part. And so in this part are nine sensors. It's got three accelerometers that measure X, Y, and Z acceleration. It's got three gyroscopes that measure X, Y, Z rotation. And it's got three magnetometers that measure magnetic field. And then inside that package is a processor running very interesting code. And it takes those nine measurements and it reduces it down to give you your absolute orientation and how you're moving through space. And then again, this is a fairly tiny package. So you can do it with reflow. But in this case, I'm using, it was about a $10 part. 
now for $25, you can get the chip on a breakout board uh, that's an easier interface to it. Uh, so that's a nine axis, uh, I, uh, IMU means inertial measurement unit. Um, uh, then simpler is you can get a six axis, lower costs, uh, smaller package that leaves off the magnetometer and even lower cost and simpler still, this is just an X, Y, Z, um, just three axis of accelerometer that just gives you X, Y, Z motion. And then one of the amusing things this does is if I turn it upside down, you'll see Z changes quite, quite a bit. That's because acceleration acts like gravity. So that's actually measuring gravity. So in, you can use this sensor if you want to know how something is oriented uh, relative to pointing up or pointing down. OK, now comes sound. So. So I've, this is a microphone, and it's measuring audio waveforms. And so you can use that just to sense, is there a sound? But you can actually uh, digitize uh, sound and amplify it, store it, analyze it. So there, what I'm using, and actually, this part is no longer for new designs. Um, this is a MEMS microphone, meaning integrated silicon, with an um, interface that's now I2S. So I2S is similar to I2C. It's very similar, but it's a version that's specific for sound. And so in this case, I, I've, I've got my SCL, my, my two pins for um, I2S. And then in this version, I'm doing this. Um, more advanced processors have I2S, simple ones doesn't. But in the example I showed you here, uh, I2S is a very simple protocol. And I'm doing I2S in software. Uh, you can do it in hardware. Here I'm doing it in software. And you'll see I've got these long blocks of code. The reason for that is I'm not using a loop. This is what's called an unrolled loop. The loop takes variable amount of time to go around the loop. By unrolling it, I take the same amount of time to do each instruction. So that's a hardware, a code implementation of I2S. And there's standard libraries for it. This is the Arduino library for I2S. And I'm going to update this. This is, um, it's become more common to have the microphone on the bottom, not the top of the package, which may sound funny. But it can be more convenient. If it's on the top of the package, the sound has to come in where all the components are. If the microphone's on the bottom of the package, you make a hole in the board, and the sound comes in on the bottom of the board, which typically is facing out to the outside world. Um, and so this is a, a bottom port one. And I'll update this example with that, but it'll, it'll be very similar. Uh, in the old days, we used to use electric microphones, and they're really obsolete now. And there are also analog MEMS, and they're pretty much obsolete because it's so convenient to do it digitally um, with I2S. If you want to measure vibrations, this is a piezo disk. And so vibration on the disk gives you a voltage out. Uh, that you, that's a good sensor if you want to see if like something, somebody's walking on the floor or taps on a door. Um, if you want to measure force, you can buy force sensing resistors. Um, you can get what are called strain gauges, which are resistors that you laminate and, and the resistance changes when you bend a beam. A load cell with that you can use to measure weight. And then finally, um, 
this is a commercial version of a capacitive force sensor. And what's going on on there is what we already saw. That was uh, Adrian's example shows you it's two plates um, and you measure the capacitance as a force sensor. Um, the, uh, let's see, Adrian is showing, uh, yeah, I, sh I, I should link this. This, this is, if you put conducting thread in fabric, um, you can then get a uh, bend sensor in the fabric. Good. Uh, if you want to measure angle, a standard way to do it is an encoder is a device that's designed to measure a rotary angle, typically optically, but you can also do that capacitively. You can make a rotary capacitor. If you want to measure pressure, there are MEMS devices whose job is for pressure. You can do that if there's higher pressure, but uh, if you use an air pressure sensor, one of the neat things with this is pressure changes with altitude. And so you can actually measure with surprisingly small changes, uh, vertical changes just by the change in air pressure. Um, so yeah, uh, for these capacitive force sensors, again, let's see, I said it quickly. Let me say this more slowly. Um, a way you deal with the noise is with uh, a shield. So wh when you're measuring the step response, uh, if this is where you're measuring, um, if, you, if you put a ground shield here, that can ruin the measurement because you get a big signal from it. But if you take the pin and you use the pin drive as the shield, the outside is very close to the inside. And so using a driven shield is a common way to protect it. But the best way to protect it is to put the processor close to it. Likewise, in the example from Adrian, uh, if you have, a sensor on one side, ground on the other, the sensor side will be sensitive to what's around it. So you can make uh, uh, something like a taco, where this is the sensor and you have ground on both sides and then you have the elastomer around it. Now the outside is completely protected. Okay, uh, this is a link to a, a sensor that's used to measure uh, um, pulse, and um, uh, yeah, your pulse and can be blood oxygenation. Uh, this is a link to sensors that measure air pollution for uh, particle measurements. Uh, there's a range of these type of sensors that are um, se resistors sensitized chemically to measure gases. And then one of the most useful sensors now increasingly is the um, sense is a somewhat more expensive version of the shao, and the, the sense is the shao with a camera. So uh, it's, the, it's, it's about $20 instead of $10, and you can actually get more than one kind of camera for it. And so here's an example where uh, this is the, the sense. I'm going to load my code. And the, oh, sorry, let me go back just here. So uh, lower left is showing the raw video. Over here, I'm inverting the video. Up top here, I'm thresholding it. And then over here, I'm doing motion detection. So it goes away when I stop and wakes up when it moves. And so 
all of that is being done in software. So this sets up the sense. Um, uh, all of this configures it. And then this is the interesting part. Down here, I get a frame of data from the camera. I turn it to a form I can use. This is the little bit of code that's inverting it. This is uh, thresholding it. This is motion detecting it. So I'm doing uh, basic image processing right in the sense. And so for things like finding how something is moving, or is it moving in and out, or what color is it, or basic shapes, you can do with that kind of image processing code uh, in the sense. Um, for more advanced image processing, OpenCV is the most popular uh, image processing library. Um, this is um, uh, a version aimed at things like embedded applications. And so OpenCV has all sorts of routines that can do more advanced things, like, for example, recognize a phrase, a face, or recognizing gestures. Um, yeah, Babkin is asking about sound intensity. Absolutely. The microphones are, uh, ha the data sheets give you very careful calibration for the signal out versus the sound intensity in. That's uh, carefully calibrated. So you do get, uh, you can get quantitative sound intensity. And then finally, right now, to talk to each other, we're using WebRTC, which is the protocol for video in a browser. Oh, I'm going to interrupt myself. In the, I didn't mention, in this example, where I'm showing the roll pitch and yaw, I didn't show the code. Um, the code is using a web serial. So, some browsers, in particular the Chrome family, know how to do serial in the browser. And so uh, this code creates a serial port from the browser, which works in Chrome. And then I'm using a, a library that I'll talk about in Interface and Application Week called 3JS. And I'm using that to do the 3D graphics. And so this is how the web page is. Uh, Everything in that example is being done from the web page. So I connect to the, my device, and then I do the 3D graphics, and that's all done just in the HTML for that example. And I was reminded of that because in this example, I'm using WebRTC to do something uh, similar. Uh, so now uh, I'm doing something similar. I'm background subtracting, I'm motion detecting, I'm thresholding. And there I'm doing that all in HTML. And so I, I connect to the camera and then in JavaScript I'm doing that. So uh, it, um, with a webcam you can do that kind of processing. Um, Leo's asking about ultraviolet light. Uh, so standard cameras typically have infrared filters that you can remove. Um, I don't know about the UV response of these. Um, uh, if you go to the photo transistors in DigiKey, you can get UV responsive ones. I don't know if how far out into short wavelengths the cameras go. So stepping back. In an hour, you're not remotely meant to master all of these. First, you should get a sense that there's many different ways to get signals in. And then I showed you talking to the pins, talking to comparators, talking to ADCs, um, talking to I2S. And then there's all these different sort of measurements you can make. Now for time management, Keep a schedule between now and finishing uh, to manage each week. So focus sensors on what you need for the final project. But beyond that, any of these are fine. And if in doubt, as I keep suggesting, if you're not sure, um, 
play with step response. The reason I like it so much is it, it turns it into arts and crafts. You can measure, not quite, but almost anything else just with the step response measurement. And with just like scissors and a vinyl cutter and foam and a few materials, you can make all sorts of interesting devices with almost nothing just with this uh, step response uh, charging. And in fact, with this trick of doing it with the PIO, you can get eight channels of it on one RP2040. Um, yeah, Ricardo's noting about addresses. I'll talk more about I2C and networking week. Uh, I2C devices have addresses and you need, um, if you have multiple ones, you have to um, deal with them managing the addresses on it. I'll talk about that in networking week. So measure something. And then just as a group, uh, use the oscilloscope to look at raw analog signals and then use logic analyzers to look at digital signals just to get a sense of what's going on in the um, communication. So then Saturday, we're back to global open time, use the team for help. And then you're gonna meet the whole fab ecosystem in the Monday recitation, but with a reminder that you need to register for that one and the next one only that's in a different location. So have fun with sensors, uh, catch up from the frenzy of machine building. We're now back to the regular pace. And once again, I'm thrilled by what you all did in machine building week. This was the strongest collection of machines uh, we've had. And it was a great combination of uh, crazy ones, fun ones, useful ones, nicely finished ones, um, simple ones. So great work on that and happy sensing. So uh, you'll join Saturdays available with the team for that. I'll see you at Monday's recitation and see you in class Wednesday and then we'll go back to the random rotation. Bye bye. 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 Bye.